Good morning. Well, it's half adults and half kids. That's good because I'm. Paul turns his attention to children this morning. Children and fathers, children and parents. Open your Bibles with me to Ephesians chapter 6. We've made it to the last chapter. In Microsoft Word, as I was looking through my sermons, they're by date, and we were in chapter 1, verse 7 this time last year, so a year in the book. Took a little bit of a break, but... This morning we're going to be in verses 1 through 4, so I promise I don't have an hour to speak on four verses, so... Ephesians chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. Paul says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise, that it may go well with you, and you may live long in the land. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. I pray that you would help me. Uh, More than that, that you would just get me out of the way and that your spirit might speak. That we may hear your word. That your word would be life to us who find it. Give us ears to hear. Father, I pray. Give these children ears to hear. I pray that they would be affected by your word as they grow in holiness, as they grow to produce fruit for your glory. I pray for fathers, for parents, that you would convict our hearts and that you would comfort us, that you would challenge us according to your word. In Jesus' name, amen. So Paul turns his attention again to children, right? Um, Opposite of what it looks like in the world, God loves children, right? Jesus, did they come to him, right? Psalm 127 First, uh, starting in verse 2, it says, Behold, children are a heritage, some translations say a blessing, from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior are the children of one's youth. Blessed is the man who fills his quiver with them. He shall not be put to shame when he speaks with his enemies in the gate. Children are first in this text a blessing. They're a heritage from the Lord. They're a reward. Not only that, but they are arrows in a quiver of a warrior. The warrior is the parent. And the hopes is raising them up in the, in the instruction and, and discipline of the Lord that when they are fired out from that, from that bow, when they are released into the world, that they would go and they would glorify God with their lives. That their lives would be fruitful because of the labor that is put into that child. God loves children. Jesus loves children, Matthew 19. Um, Matthew 19, starting in verse 13, he says, Then the children were brought to Jesus that he might lay his hands on them and pray. The disciples rebuked the people. But Jesus said, Let the children come to me and do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of heaven. And he laid his hands on them and went away. Jesus loves children. He bids they come to him because for such belongs the kingdom of heaven, he says. David confesses in his prayer, in his psalm in 139, as we read for a call to worship last week, for you, God, formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. God is... Sovereign over every child who comes forth. It is God who knits them together in the womb. Sadly, and we all know this, it's, I believe, about 2% of children in America are 
aborted before they ever have a chance to be born. All right, that's that's about twenty per every one thousand born. The total abortion since nineteen seventy three. This is a rough estimate from uh, I can't remember the name of the. There's only two that do estimates. Um, sixty four thousand basically, sixty four million. I'm sorry. Since nineteen seventy three, in the Road versus Wade ruling, sixty five million children almost have been murdered by their own parents in the womb. That's as of last year, the year and the year before, that's two percent of children born in America were aborted. Fatherlessness is twenty five percent. Twenty five percent chance that a child will grow up without a father. And, and some of us have, right? And God is good. As James' his own testimony, he has, he's given to you many times, God was his father. God was a father to him. To those without a mother, the father will take you under his wing like a mother Gary, gathers hens in her flock, right? God is gracious and kind and loving. He loves children. And God will be a father to the fatherless, but still an epidemic, 25% of homes don't have a father in them. The statistic says that 90% of runaways and homeless children come from fatherless homes. 63% of teen suicides come from fatherless homes. And 85% of children and teens with behavioral disorders come from fatherless homes. This is from an AFPI report. Even children with a father present in the home, this is homes that have a mother and a father, even Children with a father present in the home, the average school-age boy only spends about 30 minutes per week in one-on-one -on -one conversations with his father. For comparison, the same boy on average will spend about 44 hours per week watching TV, playing games, and surfing on the internet. This is from Columbia Report in 2015. So you have 2% chance you'll be aborted, 25% chance you'll be in a fatherless home, Massive chance your father won't have time for you if he is in the home. And if that's not bad enough, listen to church attendance as of 2021. Lifeway research revealed that in 2021, the regular family church attendance was 28%. And I bring those statistics, children. By the way, don't think that, oh, I'm a teenager, I'm not a child, right? This word in Greek, children, is referring to anyone who is under the authority of his father in his father's home. It's referring to, to all who are under the authority of their father still. I bring these out to say this. If you're in here right now, there's only a 28% chance. God is gracious to you. God is kind. And I hope you see that today. Paul has told us to be imitators of God, to walk in love, to walk as children of light, to walk in wisdom. And, and what we have been seeing last week with husbands and wives and this week with parents and children is the practical application. It's the practical outworking of what it looks like to walk in wisdom of what it looks like to be filled with the Spirit and to walk in the Spirit. This is the practical instruction flowing out of that. And today, again, he turns his attention to children and to fathers, to children and to parents alike, really, as we see in verse 1. So first, we see instructions for Christian children. Ephesians 6, verses 1 through 3 says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. And the first point in this, in this is that obedience is right. Obedience is right. It's right. He says, children, again, that's, that's you. If you live in your mom and dad's home, this is who he's talking to concerning obedience. 
That's, a, that's, that's all of you who live under your, the, 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 your father's household, your mother's household. Children, obey. Well, what's that technically mean? It means doing what you're told. It means hearing the word of your parents and doing what they say to do. It's a simple definition, right? Children, obey your parents in the Lord. Right there. Obedience is right, right? There's a God given order in nature that is just right. It's what's natural, right? Since it is parents who bring a child into the world and since they have more knowledge and wisdom than the child does. Right. It is right for that child to obey his or her parents. It's natural. It's not that complicated. We even see it in the animal kingdom, right? Amongst most animals anyway. You see videos or go to the zoo and and any animal with babies, that mother, that father will care for that animal, will pull that animal back into the fold, will discipline, will train. Every bird has to be taught to fly and eventually given a push out of the nest. Right? Because it's the natural order of things in the way that God has created. It's only natural that children, you should obey your parents because it's the natural order that God has designed. Right? He says, obey your parents in the Lord. In other words, your obedience to your parents is an act of worship and reverence to God. Your obedience to your parents pleases the Lord. Your obedience is to the Lord through your parents whom God has given you. You have the parents that you have by God's grand design, by his sovereign plan. Right. Some of this was hard for me to think through. Right. I I grew up in a home with I I grew up in two homes, two moms and two dads, and this was confusing. And I wrestled with some of this stuff even this weekend as I thought through this. Was I obedient? Because the rules were always changing. And that might be some circumstances. Somebody might be watching this on the Internet later. Nevertheless, we're called by God to obey our parents in the Lord. Right? Colossians 3.20 says, Children, obey your parents in everything. For this pleases the Lord. In being obedient to your parents, you are pleasing God. You are worshiping God. You are showing reverence to Christ. It says in the Lord, right? Lord is king. Uh, Lord shows his authority and he has delegated that authority to your parents. So by default, when you're obedient to your parents, you are being obedient to Christ, right? Children, your greatest duty is to obey your parents and and. That's not just haphazardly. That's not just, well, I'm going to do what they say. You should obey your parents with intention. What's his name? Matthew Henry said in his commentary that this should be with inward reverence. Reverence means to be in awe of. Children, do you ever think about your parents in a deep way? In a reverent way? Let let me share with you, young people, something that you might not realize. They spent a lot of sleepless nights patting your butt to sleep. Right? They they spent a lot of they spent a lot of moments uh, really almost in fear, just pleading with God to make that temperature go down because they're worried about their baby. Some of you might have saved for something you wanted to purchase before, and it might have taken a while. Aiden's saving for a, co- for a parakeet. I get a, to have another bird. Yay. He's been saving for quite some time, and it's taken some time, right? But the price that it costs to save up all that time, even for some of you older that have saved up for something you really wanted, we spend that on you every day just to eat, right? You should think deeply about your parents. You should think reverently about your parents and how much they love you and how they show that love for you and everything that you take for granted. 
right? Selfishness is a problem for us all. And Satan wants to attack you children also. He wants you to be selfish. He wants you to think you'll love your parents, but God calls us to be obedient. And I agree with Matthew Henry that this, there should be an inward reverence an inward, in all of your parents because God provided them for you and they care deeply for you. And from that inward reverence should flow an outward action. And it's simple. Do what you're told. There's a reason for it, right? Do what you're told. It's going to bring about blessing, as we'll see in a moment, right? This is different than what the world says. And we could go down all kinds of rabbit trails, but the postmodern world would, would interpret Ephesians 6.1 in this way. Parents, obey your children, for this will keep them happy and bring peace to your home. That's why we're where we're at as a nation in so many ways. Kids running the home. Disorder. I've, none of us have ever seen disorder to this extreme ever. And it's only compounded and increased and increased year by year. As children really dominate the home in many homes, and inactive parents were probably the result of not being obedient to their own parents. And sin has compounded. And we get the result that we've gotten. But we belong to Christ. Right? And He's called us to an obedience. He has called us as parents to, to instruct our children, to discipline our children, to care about our children enough to make them do things and tell them what to do so that they will do them and give them the opportunity to glorify God, to give them the opportunity to learn and be instructed, right? It's natural because we have gone through things. I know kids, a lot of you might think you know everything. You don't. You know, we had to learn that the hard way. There's a lot of things that we've had to learn the hard way. And so when we instruct you, it's because we've had to go through many things and we care about you. Right? Obedience is first right. Second, obedience is commanded in verse 12. And, and, and I'm going to read it from Exodus chapter 20, verse 12. Well, it, that's what Paul is appealing to here. Uh, honor your father and mother. Right? In, in the, in the um, Sermon on the Mount, Jesus kind of one up to what the law said. He said, you've heard it said you shall not have committed adultery. I say, if you even look at another woman in lust, another person in lust, you're guilty of adultery already. I tell you, you've heard it said, don't commit murder. If you even have a hatred in your heart for your brother, you're guilty already. Here, Paul does the same thing Jesus did. He one-ups the obedience. Honor your mother and your father. Right? Obedience means to do what you're told. Honor is to show respect, to give recognition, often implying action to show that honor. You're showing respect, right? Uh, oh, this is a, an inward thing that out of it flows the obedience. We're to honor, we're to show respect, give recognition. And again, Paul is appealing here to the fifth commandment and 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 maybe you think that you know i thought jesus fulfilled the law right that, that we're not under law but we're under grace the problem is that the law reveals the holiness of god and we should love the law because it reveals the holiness of god right and it's the holy spirit that enables us to practice this righteousness every day in our lives to honor our mother and father and this is not just for children who are in the home, right? Uh, we don't oh, oh, we're not held liable as adults to obey our parents who we've left their home to be cling to our husband or our wife and have our own families. We're no longer under that, right? We, we're not to be obedient to that anymore, but we're always to honor them. 
Right? And so, so this steps out beyond just the children in the home, but for all of us. But we are to honor our mother and our father, our father and our mother, and it's the Spirit that enables us to practice this law that God has established that reveals His holiness. I like how Romans 8, 3, and 4, James uses these verses quite often. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do by sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin. He condemns sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. The righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. We are to honor our mother and our father in Christ died, sanctifying us completely, giving us the Holy Spirit that we might walk therein and be obedient that that we uh, that this might be fulfilled in us according to the spirit it says in verse 4 god commands we honor our parents and the spirit enables us to fulfill it the spirit at work in us helps us to honor our father and mothers right it's just as wrong in the new testament church as it was in the old testament people of god to dishonor our parents Thankfully for all of you, um, in the Old Testament, if, if, if you cursed your father and mother, they were to put you to death. So, parents, you can't do that. Not that you're tempted. Maybe sometimes. Right? It's an Old Testament law that still applies. It's the moral law of God. We should honor our mother and father. Warren Wiersbe says to honor our parents means much more than simply to obey them. It means to show them respect and love and care for them as long as they need us and to seek to bring honor to them by the way we live. Right? We honor our parents in the way that we live when we are obedient, especially somewhere else. I, 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 once in a blue moon, doesn't happen too much anymore in this culture, but once in a blue moon, a young man will open the door for Or I'll see them open the door for somebody and I'm sure to tell them, hey, thank you, you're a gentleman. You know, I, I, uh, when your children do something, Gabriel, the other night, Wednesday night, was answering a question, did a fine job, and I could just see Julie smiling from ear to ear, right? As he brought joy to his mom. Right, honor is an action And it has to do with the attitudes of our hearts, right? And how critical is this command? The first four commandments, speaking of the ten, have to do with our relationship to God. And the first is, you shall have no other gods before me. And it is a foundational command to the three that will follow it. Commandments two through three. The order of these commandments are important. The fifth commandment, Actually, 5 through 10, these commandments have to do with relationship to other human beings. And which, uh, uh, and, and which command precedes them all? Honor your mother and your father. This is the first commandment in those commandments that have to do with our relationship to other people. Honor your mother and father. This command is foundational command, and it proceeds murder committing adultery, stealing, lying, covetousness. Why is that? Because if we get this right at an early age, if we embrace this law and we are obedient to honoring our mother and father, it'll save us from being tempted in these other regards. Murder. No one who honors their mother and their father in a biblical way would murder, would steal, would lie, would cheat, would covet what somebody else has, would commit adultery. Right? It's the foundation. It's foundational. It's for the children. Honor your mother and your father. Right? And why do parents want their kids to be obedient? One because it pleases God and it pleases us, but two, it's, it's so that you will prosper. It's so that you will prosper. Your obedience has to do with your prosperity in the future. 
This is the next thing. Obedience brings blessing. Look what he says, honor your father and your mother. This is the first commandment with a promise. It has a promise attached to it that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. Right? This promise originally applied to the Jews as they were entered Canaan, but Paul applied it to believers today. Right? Paul applied it to the believers today. Then they would live long in the land of Israel. And Paul brings that into the New Testament to say you will live long on the earth. Some translations say you will live long in the land. We have no promise as the church of a particular land other than heaven someday, but that you will just live long. You will live long on the earth, right? The Christian ch uh, child who honors his parents can expect two great blessings, that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. Right. This is not to say this doesn't mean that if someone doesn't live long, that they automatically dishonored their parents. That's not what this is saying. The principle is this. When children honor their parents, they avoid many sinful, destructive and dangerous things that threaten to cut their life short. Uh, m many of you who are adults know many people have, who have passed on because of a foolish lifestyle. Right? I don't know how many people that I went to school with, what feels like a really long time ago, who didn't live long. Whether it was drug abuse or just living recklessly, living dangerously, living wildly, living without a care in the world, never honored their mother and father, always was a rebellious one. And their life was cut short because they were ignorant and because they did foolish things. And the result of that foolishness was a shortened life. This reminded me a while back I was in the barn looking for something and I ran across to um, brought tears to my eyes. I ran across these three letters that I had from an inmate in 1996. He had uh, I had just been saved. I I was just on fire for Jesus. I didn't know a whole lot, but what I did know, I was letting her rip. And my grandpa had a jail ministry. And so on the weekends, I would go with my grandpa to the jail. And there was an individual there who would never listen, who would always argue. And, and I came one weekend, and my grandpa kind of wanted me to avoid this guy, but I wouldn't. I'm like, oh, let me at him. And I shared the gospel with this guy, and his heart broke. He later told me that, to see a 15 year old kid give up his weekend to come in here and share this message just broke him. And so I developed a relationship with this guy. His name was Robert. I don't remember his last name. It's on the letter. And, and I would go back, uh, I think every other weekend and I would talk to Robert and we would share the gospel, what, what I knew of it, what, what word I knew I'd study hard, uh, probably more for his sake than my own. But I, I just, I, I was excited to see here I had come to Christ and I had, I had preached to my first person and, and I'd seen a change in their heart. And as time went on, he told me how much I meant to him and how much that time meant to him. And he eventually went to a penitentiary and he wrote me a few letters. And in one of those letters, he told me how grateful he was and how encouraging I was to him. And how that has changed the entire trajectory of his life, though he would spend it in prison. He said, if I can encourage you in any way, let me encourage you from the word in, in this way. And it said, Exodus 20, verse 12, honor your mother and father that it may go well with you. And beneath that, it said, if I would have listened to this, I would not be wasting my days away in this place. God not only increases the length of our days as a blessing, but also the joy in each day. Not only the quantity, but the quality of our life. Any of you young people just ever been upset with mom and dad in your room or out kicking around and you're just upset and you're miserable? Isn't it fun being miserable with mom? What are you smiling for, mister? Is that you, huh? <laughs> right? Sin always robs you. Sin always robs you. 
and obedience. It always enriches your lives. Kids, young people, listen closely. I need you to realize that God cares about you deeply. And God gave you his words for your good. In this book, God is not only dealing with the adults. He's not only uh, dealing with husbands and wives. This command is for children who live under the authority of their parents. Which says a lot that they were present in these gatherings in Ephesus. God is speaking to you. God wants you to be obedient and honor your parents. And I get it. I know how hard that is. Satan attacks you just like he attacks us. His, his you know, we'll see soon following that our, our wrestle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers and principalities and dark places. There's a battle going on in the spirit and Satan doesn't want you to be obedient. I understand that. It's hard, right? I, I, was, a, I was a kid too. I, I remember how hard it was. In fact, like I said earlier, I grew up in two homes and the rules were different. It was like walking a thin line. I know how hard it is. Sometimes parents don't listen to you that well. That's tough. Sometimes parents misunderstand you. I've been guilty. Right? Sometimes you might think they're telling you what to do because they don't want to do it themselves. Right? I'm going to let you know a little secret. Parents aren't perfect. Parents aren't perfect. However, God's command to us doesn't say honor your father and mother if they deserve it. God's command to children does not say honor your father and mother If you think they're right, the scripture says, children, honor your mother and your father, your father and your mother, regardless. And that's a difficult thing sometimes. It's a difficult thing, but there's no stipulation. We do it. Honor your mother and your father that it may go well with you that you may have a prosperous life, that you may have a long life. And this is evident. You can see this in the lives of people who are faithful. You can see this in the lives of people whose parents were believers and brought up their children in the Lord. And many of you are adults now with children and raising your children in the Lord. And there is a great blessing and benefit to that. There is a prosperity in that. There is a quality of life in that that we don't see out there. Out there is falling apart. It begins with honoring your mother and father. And God says it will go well with you and that you will live long in the land. Next instruction to fathers. So it's so y'all can take a breather, kids. It's time for the fathers. Ephesians 6, 4 says, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. First, fathers are not to provoke anger, right? In Paul's day, the father had supreme authority over the family. When a baby was born into, Ro into a Roman family, for example, it was brought out and laid before the father. If he picked it up, it meant he was accepting it into the home. But if he did not pick it up, it meant the child was rejected. It could be sold, given away, or even killed by exposure. It's rough. Right? And in the midst of this, Paul told parents, don't use your authority to abuse the child, but to encourage and to build up that child. Right? Provoke means make angry. God was provoked when Uzzah touched the ark and God killed him. Made him angry. Right? When we poke the bear, <laughs> we're making it angry. 
right? To provoke is to make angry. And I wrestle with this. When I wrestled with this more yesterday and last night and this morning, and, and I know this is going on to the internet, so before I say anything else, I love my stepfather. I honor him. I honor his memory. I appreciate him greatly. But I can relate to this. This was my early days. I couldn't do anything right. I was always provoked to anger. And it led to oppression. I couldn't do anything right. It was hard to honor a father. It was, it was hard to be obedient. I just wanted to rebel because he was always provoking me to anger. Right? And this comes with a lot of wisdom. And this comes with a lot of understanding our children. This is why we must spend much time with our children, instructing them, loving them, caring for them, and not just they exist in the background while we're going through this thing called life. We must know our children. Look, to one child, you might literally get on to them and they feel so bad for what they've done that nothing else is needed. And the next child might need to get beat <laughs> to get it through their thick head. Some are shaking their heads. Yep, that's my kids. Right? Each kid is different. Each child is different. I, I have, to, and I have to, to, to correct my children differently in, in many, many, many cases. Right? Let me threaten them both. But you know, we don't provoke them to anger. Right? We don't, we don't beat them down to get what we want out of them. We have to care enough to shepherd them, right? to shepherd them as Jesus is shepherding us and bringing us forward to correct them. We're not to provoke them to anger that leads to some hard things. I'm, I'm, I'm so grateful that the Lord saved me at the age he did. And though he did, I, I was hurt for a period of time in a church and I, I, I did not live as I ought for about two years. And, and a lot of that I blamed on that oppression and that being constantly driven to anger. And I was rebellious and I had a lot of pinned up things that we don't want to put that into our children. We don't want to provoke our children to anger, but whether we want to love them, right? They might get angry and they may be wrong. That's, that's a totally different thing. But to provoke them does not create an atmosphere in their hearts to where we can bring the truth. It creates an atmosphere in the heart where they want to run and hide, right? Each child is different. We must do our due diligence to know our children and to meet our children where they need us to meet them as the Lord meets us right where we need to be met. Fathers are to discipline second. Another word for discipline is training, right? Proverbs 22, 6 says, Train up a child in the way he should go. Even when he is old, he will not depart from it. Right? This has to do with, some might think discipline has to do with putting a belt to the backside. That's not discipline. Discipline has to do with training and bringing them bringing them up, instructing them, them, right? Or actually instruction has to do with warning of wrong behavior, right? And we see this in 1 Corinthians 10, 12. Fathers are to instruct. Now these things happened to them as an example, but they were written down for our instruction on whom the end of the ages has come, right? Some things happened as a warning and it was for our instruction. Again, back to Uzzah, he touched the ark. God showed his people an important lesson that day, what not to do. Don't touch my ark. Right? What a warning. Fathers are to not provoke their children to anger. Fathers are to train up their children. That's the responsibility of fathers, ultimately. Right? We work hand in hand with our our wives and we work together in these things and make decisions together in these things as I said last last week right we we work together complement one another in these things but this falls on fathers 
2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 says, All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Right? The, 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 the all Scripture is, is breathed out by God, and we should use that Scripture in disciplining and training our children. Right? It's profitable for teaching. They need to be taught in the Word of God, and that responsibility will ultimately fall on the fathers. They need to be taught in the Scriptures. They need to be taught God, who God is. Right? It's, it's profitable for reproof. That means to test with the Word in order to bring conviction. Right? How often do we just get on to our children but never bring the reproof, never bring the Scripture in to bear on the child's heart, just get on to them for the sake of that is wrong? I'm guilty. Right? Of, of, I ain't got time to go dig out of Scripture. Just don't do it because I said. Right? Versus taking the time to reproof our children to test them this is what the scripture said this is what you have just done and pray that the word of god would bear upon the heart of our children this is what the scripture is for it reproves for correction i love this this word actually means to be restored to a right state Not only should we use the Word of God to reprove our children and to test them, to show that that they are in sin, but to comfort them, to restore them in righteousness with the Word of God, to encourage them, to build them up in the Word of God, and for training in righteousness. I think this has to do with our whole system of being raised up from the time they're able to understand until the time we marry them off and send them out the door. It's this complete package. It's for training in righteousness. The Word of God should shape the home that our children will someday have. Now, ultimately, it's up to God to work in our children when they go out the door. Many children have come from godly homes and been ungodly people most of the time. They would eventually come to faith. There's the story of that and a couple people in this church. Right? God has to do the God has to ultimately do the work, but he promises that it won't leave them. And that he won't forsake them. That word won't forsake them. And eventually, God will do his work. Right? Fathers, there's a great weightiness upon us. We'll one day stand before the King of Kings and give account to how we loved our wives which are his daughters and how we raised and cared for his children. They're his kids or just the earthly parents, right? We'll stand before God and give account. Fathers, are you just passing the days trying to get by or are you intentional in raising up your children in the discipline and instruction of the Lord because it's critical? As critical as it is for the child to obey their parents that it may go well with them, that they may prosper in the land, it is critical that fathers instruct and bring their children up that they might know and walk in that way. We can't, again, control the outcome of our children but that, that, that's where prayer comes in. We can certainly be on our knees and we should often plea in that God, that God would so sovereignly and so graciously control the outcome of our children, to plead for our children's souls, to plea for our children's future. And this is where some grandparents and, and those of you who might not have kids in the home at the moment come in to this very text you can plead for your grandchildren you can plead for the children of others in this church because that's tomorrow that's the future and it's not looking great right now lots of prayers needed for our children so I'd call upon you to pray
Last Christ is our example. Jesus' obedience as a child to earthly parents is seen in Luke 2, 51 and 52. This is right after they left him in the temple and he was found preaching. It says, uh, And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was submissive to them. And his mother treasured up all these things in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. Jesus as a child was obedient, was humble, was submissive to his earthly parents. Right? In, in uh, John 5, we see Jesus' obedience to his heavenly Father in verse 19. So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the Father doing, for whatever the Father does, that the Son does likewise. Jesus was obedient to the Father. And we see that it was even unto death, right? Um, uh, uh, whether you're a parent or a child, there's forgiveness for your disobedience. And that's because of this greatest act of obedience. Philippians 2, Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though He was in the form of God, He was in the heavens. He always was. Christ has always been. But He did not account equality with God a thing to be grasped. But He emptied Himself. By taking on the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Are you obedient, children? You need to understand that Christ was to the point of death. And because you come to church and are being raised in church and because your parents come to church and because your parents love Christ and believe in Christ, it's not enough for you. Your sin is a serious thing, young people. Your sin is serious and it separates you from a holy God. You have to personally look to the Lord Jesus Christ. You personally have to see your own sin, your own disobedience, and understand that God hates sin. And you have to personally put faith in Christ, understanding that His death was enough to cover your sin, that His death was enough to satisfy the wrath of God, You must be born again. And thanks be to God, He did send His Son and He was obedient even unto death. Thereby God has highly exalted Him and bestowed on Him the name that is above every name so that at the name of Jesus Christ every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and uh, and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. I encourage you young people to be obedient. These commands to husbands and wives, to parents and children, again, are practical application of what it means to walk in wisdom according to chapter 5, verse 15. And to be filled with the Spirit, chapter 5, verse 18. Children ought to obey their parents in the Lord, which means they should obey as part of their commitment to Christ. Fathers are instructed to train their children in the ways of Christ. Right? Paul not only argues children to obey and honor their parents, but provides motivation for doing so. He gives them three reasons. One, because it's right. We even see it in nature. Number two, because God commands it. It's in His law. And number three, because great blessings will follow your obedience. Children are to obey their parents as long as they live with them and honor their parents as long as they live. Right? We should still honor our parents. Right? By singling out fathers, Paul highlights their leadership role in the family. And sadly, unfortunately, this responsibility is abandoned by many men today. 
Fathers should be actively engaged in training and warning their children in the ways of God and modeling what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. Amen? Let's pray. Father, thank You for today. Father, I thank You for every child that is in here, and I pray, I plead with You, Father, that You would save their souls, that You would minister to their hearts, that they would see their sinfulness, I pray for every child in here that they would consider deeply their parents that you have given to them and that they would be in all of them. That you would set aside their selfishness by your Spirit and you would allow them to think deeply about these things. That you, the sovereign Lord of the universe, have given them the parents that they have And I pray that a gratitude would come up in their hearts. As they consider there's a 28% chance they're even here. With many children who are aborted, with many children who grow up in fatherless homes, you chose to put them in a place where they are loved and where they are being raised to honor you and to have eternal life. And I pray that you'd be gracious to our children that you would help them to live obedient lives, that it may go well with them, that they may leave our home someday, that, that sons would cling to wives, that wives would marry godly men. And I pray that the fruit of this very command to honor our mother and father would be revealed in future generations for those that are here hearing even now. Father, I pray for us fathers, for us parents alike, that you would so challenge us. Help us to remember in every moment not to provoke our children to anger. Help us to remember in every moment uh, not only are we to uh, discipline our children and to correct our children, but we have to do it with the Word of God. Give us grace. and intentionality as we shepherd our children, as we bring them up. Father, I thank You for Your Word. I pray that You would receive our worship. I pray that You would be honored in this place. I pray that You'd be glorified and that You would look on us with great pleasure. In Jesus' name, amen.